I'll try not to <laughs> remove your pants. <laughs> okay, so give me the yeah, this thing here, and then do that. Okay, then if I do it like that, that works. Okay, good. Okay. All right, thank you, Niall. Um, uh, go for it. Okay. So, hello everybody, my name is uh, Niall Jeffrey. So, I'm presenting our results with this problem, uh, and it's work done with uh, Ben Vandel, who presented some of it before, and also Francois Boulanger and a few other people at the Ecole Normale Superior. Um, and I want to say, given this is meant to be a, a, a debate meeting of some kind, that I would, I would make the claim that the problem as presented here is one that only can be uh, can only be solved with machine learning but if we're cosmologists and want to do principal inference we want to do that in a Bayesian way uh, so things you might want to think about when I present this so we're doing it in a single we're doing f uh, single frequency CMB B mode inference uh, using only a single training image so that might bring up questions of data augmentation and also how do you validate this uh, posterior probability interpretation at the end so I'll start with the results. So uh, this is a, a patch, a kind of bicep-like patch of, uh, foregr uh, of data where it's dominated by foregrounds. We want to see the underlying uh, uh, B-mode signal. In reality, in this work, we actually use both E and B-mode simultaneously, but I'll just show the B-mode. Oh, OK. <laughs> um, and, so, and then using our uh, high-dimensional likelihood free inference scheme, we're able to uh, estimate the mean of the posterior distribution for every pixel of our B-mode signal, and we're also able to get the posterior marginal variance for every pixel in our B-mode signal as well. And we can do uh, other moments of the post pro posterior probability. And uh, if we validate this work, we're validating it in our limiting case that we've chosen where uh, we're only using a single frequency uh, pixel level and noise-free, uh, which which makes the challenge of doing the foreground marginalization even greater in this likelihood free inference framework. Okay, so the outline and challenges and things we've developed here are, first of all, the high dimensional likelihood free inference framework. Our, how we do our forward model in particular, given we say we only use a single training image. And finally, posterior probability validation. So, first of all, high dimensional likelihood free inference, and in particular, moment, net moment networks, which uh, uh, Ben discussed before. So, in parameter inference, we have some data, which is drawn from some distribution, and we also have some unknown parameters. And our, in our case, our unknown parameters are the individual elements of our signal in our B mode uh, maps. And in t uh, typically, in um, uh, likelihood free inference, from uh, draws of data from this conditional probability distribution, which are just known as simulations. That's exactly what a simulation is. Uh, and from labels uh, of the true values, we're able to reconstruct uh, conditional probabilities like here, uh, for example, using density estimation methods. So uh, you might want to, from a set of training data of labeled with the true values of the signal and our training data, you might want to estimate this uh, density, which would, for example, give you the likelihood. Uh, and I would say that I think this is the way that people should do principled uh, inference in these kind of machine learning settings. But if we want to just do the full density estimation problem here, it's going to be very difficult because that signal I showed has 10 to the power 5 elements in it. So you can't estimate a, uh, a density in such a high dimension. So what, what can we do instead? So this is some work... Uh, that uh, I worked on with uh, Ben Bandelt, and these are moment networks. So it does two things. It first of all, sidesteps the density estimation problem. We say that what do you usually want when you're doing an inference problem, you actually only really care about the mean and the standard deviation. And we can discuss that in more detail later if you want. But, uh, but also, we only typically care about the marginals between the lower dimensional pairs of parameters. It's not possible as a human to interpret uh, a million dimensional probability distribution, I would say. So how do these moment networks work? So uh, it's a hierarchy of networks that use square losses. And in this framework, I'm imagining that all my training data and all my parameters uh, that are labeling my training data are drawn from their priors and through a hierarchical uh, model so that everything is in, in a kind of principled 
uh, way that we, all the distributions are the ones you would still use if you were solving this analytically, if you knew the likelihood, which we don't. Okay, so we have a hierarchy of networks, our first network F, so we draw, so our training data, if they're drawn from the cor correct distributions, form this joint distribution, and if we learn our first network under a square loss, then this first network will, uh, if we minimize this J naught, integrated over our training, uh, training data, then F ap applied to the real data will be our posterior mean. So th this is exact uh, independent of the uh, distributions you're talking about. It doesn't have to be Gaussian. And then what we say is we do another layer. So now we go to the next hierarchy of the moment network where we have a G network. And this now, we just plug in our first network into the first part of our squared loss. So now, if we train this again over the joint density, uh, joint distribution of data and uh, parameters, then our second network, G, will, uh, once trained, uh, give an estimate of the posterior variance as well. So we're able to do likelihood-free inference in extremely high dimension using this hierarchy of networks. Okay, so, so we've solved the inference problem to begin with. Now for the model. Okay. So, uh, dust foregrounds, polarized dust foregrounds in cosmic microwave background. They're extremely difficult to measure and we're typically data starved. So we don't have large amounts of training data that we can use in this forward modeling framework. So what do we do? We can't use a generative adversarial network, for example, because that itself requires lots of data to train. So we, re we turn to uh, a new method uh, called wavelet phase harmonic synthesis, where we only need one single training image from which we can generate many more training images. Okay, so, so a rough background of these methods. So we start off with an input image, uh, which we might want to synthesize new realizations of. We apply wavelet convolution, so filters, multi-scale filters to get um, to, to our in initial image. And then we apply phase operations, which effectively just spin up the phase of the, uh, of the uh, complex part. So once you do these phase operations, which is a nonlinear function, now once you correlate uh, the different uh, layers of the filter, of the filter output, they have non-zero covariance. And th those covariance terms are the exact things that we use to characterize our signal. So from these covariance terms, we can generate new realizations that match these statistics. Now you might note that this series of filtering followed by nonlinear transformations is exactly what's going on in a convolutional neural network. And that's how these methods were uh, developed to emulate that kind of procedure. So we get the benefits of a GAN, but we don't have to have lots of training data to generate our new realizations. So I now have my Q map, my polarization foreground map from uh, dust. This is all on simulations, by the way, but we can apply it to real data as well. But using simulations, I can validate it. Um, and I can generate many more realizations just from my one single training image. I'll just talk briefly about the signal as well, not just the foregrounds. Uh, we generate our signals from a prior based on the Planck posterior distribution, and also the foreground amplitude is drawn according to a prior from uh, the Planck analysis as well. So in our training data, we really sample different realizations where, for example, in this case, our signal at L of 1000 uh, has power greater than the foregrounds, and in this case, uh, we never get uh, signal to noise greater than one. So we sample over this uh, kind of large prior volume. And now the results, so uh, I showed you it before, so we have our true map. This is on validation data, not on synthesized data, real simulations, independent. We have our, we have our truth, our data, and we're able to reconstruct the posterior mean. So before I go on to my final part where we discuss how do we uh, validate the full posterior distribution. I just want to comment on the posterior mean that if we briefly forget that it's a posterior mean and just think of this as a foreground cleaning method, we can think of it as a point estimate and calculate the effective signal to noise uh, of our uh, reconstructed map compared to the initial data. So we really improve the signal to noise. But posterior validation. So at the start, I showed you the mean and the variance for, these, for this data. And how can I test the posterior? 
And me just saying that it's Bayesian doesn't make me right. I need to actually show that mm, I'm getting what I expect I am. So what, first of all, what does a wrong answer look like very quickly? So if I take my, mock dat my data from before and I have a statistical model that my foregrounds are Gaussian, I can solve this analytically and get my posterior mean. And this is uh, blooming awful because you have all of these, uh, this excess power in the places where there's a lot of foreground, which is the opposite of what you want. Because if you have a lot of foreground, you want your posterior mean to get pushed towards uh, zero or to because it's been pushed there by the prior. And this is exactly what's happening in uh, the case uh, from our results using our moment networks, where when there's a lot of foreground, like at the bottom here, the posterior mean gets pushed towards zero and also the posterior marginal variance gets high. So it's doing roughly the right thing, but maybe we want to quantify how well it's doing. And so how we do this? So we rescale our residuals. So we take our posterior mean, our true pixel values, and, re and, res and rescale them by the posterior variance. So if these, our estimates are really the posterior mean and the posterior variance, or the posterior standard deviation, as it as it actually is, um, then these values should be distributed with mean zero and standard deviation one. And if that's true, it means both our, for our forward model, i.e. the synthesis with a single training, training image is working, and our moment networks are really giving the posterior distribution because this is test on, tested on independent, non-synthesized simulations. So let's see what the distribution of these uh, values are for our example. Or not? One doesn't work. Okay. <laughs> and this is the result. So we can see that it ma is matched extremely well by a distribution. So these are the histogram of uh, these rescaled residuals, and they have zero mean and standard deviation one. The Gaussianity is just uh, not included in our, our model in any way. That just happens to be the way our posterior looks and we can finally show that it works for many other independent s simulation realizations. Showing this method is robust, the foreground modeling is robust using a single training image, and our moment networks are really doing likelihood-free inference in high dimension, and we've validated our posterior distribution. So, thank you. Thank you, Nile. <laughs> Do we have questions in the audience for Niall? So here you are, you're using a, a simulation, right, for the uh, for the foregrounds? Yes. Yeah, you said is that you can use real data as well. Have you tried that? What kind of data are, are you going to use, and uh, what do you expect in terms of accuracy? So yeah, so we can use real data. So this is just initial work, but we can actually infer these wavelet phase harmonic statistics from real data in the presence of noise and contamination. So for example, in a simple case, you could take a few representative patches from the Planck data, marginalize away the effect of the CMB and the noise, learn those, sti learn those statistics, and now you have a generative model of the dust, and you could apply it to real data from a different patch of the sky, for example. Oh, we have a question from Mark and then Yanya. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the talk, nice. Um, I had a question regarding the, the augmentation you make of your images. You say, I can make a GAN with a single image, which is a bit surprising. So uh, is this, can you say more about this? So it's just that the images are simple enough so that, or how do you check that they have enough diversity? It, it's not a GAN, it's... So I know, I know, yeah. but you, can Im you said something. I, I know it's not a GAN, but... So, so how, do I, how do I test if the, the, the synthesis, are the, the test is really in this plot here? Because then, when we trained our moment network using these synthesized images, we then validate it on unsynthesized actual independent simulation, and our posterior is, a, our posterior is correct. So it means that the synthesis is good enough for this problem. So it, it might depend on the problem. Uh, sorry, Hiranya Pierre. So, um, uh, in the case that you're using this on real data, imagine that you've inferred a, a dust model. To what extent can you interrogate that model and work out how it, it corresponds to physical expectations? Yes, yeah, so, so 
kind of the problem in the dust case is that the simulations never seem to match the data at exactly, all. Exactly, that's my point, yeah. So the, the rough idea of one particular approach could be you use those simulations as a broad prior of possible dust models, and then we're looking at uh, doing a, uh, a Bayesian inference on these phase harmonic, this representation from the actual data. So, th so then you could, so we can just ignore the CMB if we just care about the dust model and treat that as an inference of our dust model, and then do science with that directly. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Nile, again.